This is Adventist World Radio, the voice of hope. Glad you could join me on this brand new edition of New Life Program. And hopefully, we will enjoy each other's company. I'm your host, Victor Yacharo. Today, Juliet Bange will discuss a topic exclusive for parents, but will also be worthwhile to you who is not a parent. Pastor Kigunun Riga will talk to us about prayers, a topic that sounds familiar, hence the cause to be curious on what he has on this. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing by great Redeemer's praise The glories of my God and King The glories of my God and King of His grace, the triumphs of His grace. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Listener, I hope that you're still enjoying the show. Let us now listen to Gillette Bange with the topic Parental Guidance. Stay tuned. Hello, listener. Welcome once again to this Family Life session. Today we shall look into ways in which parents can help their adolescents to grow morally and spiritually upright. If you are ever in problems with your child at adolescent stage, there are ways to deal with these problems. Today's program is helpful for both parents and their children. I ask you to join me as I take you through. Parents can help their adolescent when they respect his privacy. A teenager needs privacy. And parents need not feel rejected because the bedroom is close to them. The need for privacy should also include personal letters, diaries, and even phone calls. Parents who search through a teenager's room or personal effects, seeking evidence of secret activities, is violating their child's right to privacy. If you suspect that your youngster may be taking drugs, such seizure is in order. But confiscating diaries and letters a routine searching through pockets, purses, and drawers is not a parental right. We as parents should respect our children's privacy. Make the home attractive. Small considerations such as a neat personal appearance and a clean house can save a teenager embarrassment when friends visit. A teenager is sensitive to his peers' reaction toward his parental appearance, 
that even if he might need a comb himself, never stop doing things together as a family. One of the greatest influences on the happiness of the family is the feeling of companionship and understanding which comes from playing together. Don't make it a routine that the only time a youngster sees you is when you're correcting him. Criticizing him or telling him what to do or what not to do is wrong. Advise your teenager in a clever and organized manner. A teenager does not respond to a parade of don'ts, yet inwardly he craves for guidance. He is seemingly caught between opposing forces. A teenager usually rebels at the infraction of his bedroom, especially when his parents become arbitrary over things that he feels he can handle himself. However, a teenager needs the anchor of parental discipline to hold him during this time of life. Discipline should be fair and never divided. No youngster should be allowed to play one parent against the other. Where a decision must be reached, the father as a leader of the family unit should assume this responsibility. Also, you must try to respect his cry for independence. A teenager needs bonds but not bondage. Therefore, parents must distinguish between the two. Often parents fear to grant independence to an adolescent because the youngster is not old enough to handle it. The mistake parents make is that they do not make him wiser by reminding him that he is not old enough in good time. When your teenager indicates that he wants more freedom, step back a little and allow him to make his own decisions and also bear the responsibility himself. Usually, if he's not ready for his newfound freedom, he will come back to you and ask for further guidance. Managing a teenager successfully means balancing love and discipline on a scale of good humor. A sense of humor is an antidote for taking the teen years too seriously. Laughter in the home creates an atmosphere of acceptance and joy. The teenager needs to learn to enjoy family living and laugh with others and at himself. It may help to promote better understanding of siblings privately with younger members of the family concerning areas of conflict where understanding is needed. By taking them into partnership on this matter, you can help them better understand adolescence when they reach this stage themselves. Many parents don't really listen to their teenager. They couldn't care less about the thoughts and feelings of their teenager. They see him as a kid. You must listen to him the way you would like him to listen to you as a parent. Mature love for a teenager means that mother and father are ready to share in the life and growth of their child and to release that growing person into an ever enlarging sphere of existence. Parents should give small children large quantities of physical affection. Lastly, parents provide a model of a happy marriage. Teenagers need to see their parents express their love for each other. They need the attention of both parents. If parents could resolve the problems that keep them from fully enjoying their own marital relationship, many of their teenagers' problems might vanish also. A teenager's security is greatly enhanced by the security evident in his family. That winds our program today. We have seen how we can nurture our children, especially those approaching the adolescent stage and the adolescents themselves. This depends on the parental relationship and the parent-child relationship. Until the next program, I am Juliet. Thank you for keeping it Adventist World Radio, the voice of hope. We will be glad to receive your views, comments and suggestions concerning the program. You can send them to the producer, Adventist World Radio, P.O. Box 42276, code 00100, Nairobi, Kenya. We are also online at awrnairobi at eau.adventist.org. There were ninety and nine that safely lay in the shelter of the fold. But one was out on the hills away, far off from the gates of
shepherd made answer this of mine as wandered away from me and although the road be rough and steep I go to the desert to Then all through the mountains thundering, and up from the rocky steep, there arose a glad cry to the gate of him, Rejoice, I have found my sheep. And the angels echoed For the Lord brings back his own Rejoice for the Lord brings back his own You are tuned in to Adventist World Radio, the voice of hope. I'm your presenter, Victor Nyacharo. It's now time for the eagerly awaited Bible segment by Pastor Kigundu Ndwiga on prayer. Be enlightened. Dear listener, today I want us to talk about prayer. Now, let's perform a test. Take three deep breaths. One, two, and hold the last one. How long can you go without breathing? A few days? Of course not. Not even a few hours. The longest humans can last without air is a few moments at best. Somebody said, at most four hours. Prayer is like that. Prayer is to our spiritual lives as air is to our physical. It is what energizes our new nature and refreshes our soul. Without it, our Christian lives become spiritually stagnant. Why? Because prayer is the one activity that brings us into an encounter with the living God. You can be involved in every kind of Christian activity without being empowered by the Holy Spirit except prayer. Ron Doon asserts that prayer alone requires you to be right with God because it is a man-to-God encounter. So there is an earnest entry to prayer. When we read Second Chronicles 7 verse 14, it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn away from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. My favorite author, Ellen White in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 2003 says, The greatest victories to the Church of Christ or individual Christians are not those that are gained by talent or education, by wealth or favor. They are those victories that are gained in the audience chamber with God when earnest agonizing faith lays hold upon the mighty arm of power. Ian Bounds, in his powerful book on prayer, asks, Where are the apostolic leaders who can put God's people to praying? Let them come to the front and do the work, and it will be the greatest work to be done. We greatly need someone who can set the saints to this business of praying, and the one who can set the church to praying will be the greatest of reformers and apostles. None but praying leaders can have praying followers. Praying apostles will get praying saints, and a praying pulpit gets praying pews. Philip Henry said, Let prayer be the key of the morning and the bolt at night. Then he added, The best way to fight against sin is to fight it on our knees. 
my friend Enoch Chifamba made this powerful statement. Much prayer, much power. Little prayer, little power. No prayer, no power. All prayer, all power. Now, when we talk about prayer, there are four aspects of prayer. The first one is adoration. Second, confession. Third, thanksgiving. Lastly, supplication. Adoration. The word adoration means to worship or to praise. The Hebrew word translated worship in Psalm 29 verse 2 means to bow down or to prostrate oneself. It describes the attitude of worship. In Psalm 102, the word worship is a translation of another Hebrew word. Here it means to serve or to work. This verse describes the action of worship. So when we read Psalm 106 verse 2, it says, Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can show forth all his praise? The psalmist in Psalm 106 verse 2 uses a common literary tool by expressing the same. So we need to reflect on some mighty acts of God in our lives. David's prayer of praise is found in 1 Chronicles 29 verse 1 to 13. These are his words. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and the earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and the power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Worship is enhanced as we come to know the attributes and the character of God. The second thing in prayer is confession. That is the second component of prayer. If I cherished sin in my heart, the Lord will not have listened. Psalm 66 verse 18. This verse teaches that there is a relationship between sin and prayer. Sin short circuits our fellowship with God and keeps him from hearing our prayer. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba, he prayed this prayer of confession. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. That is Psalm 51, verse 2 to 5, verse 10 and 12. Genuine confession results in a desire to obey God. Notice that after David confesses his sin to God, he asks God to give him an obedient heart. The third component of prayer is thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So, we must give thanks in all circumstances. A-L-L, all circumstances. The verb to give thanks is a command. God requires that, as an act of our will, we give thanks in all circumstances. Romans 8 verse 28 explains why we can do this. It says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This verse teaches us that no matter what happens in our lives, God is able to use all things, good or bad, for our good. The last aspect of prayer, the last component of prayer, is supplication. Supplication is bringing our request to God. Too often, we become worried and forget the one person who can help. When we read Philippians 4 verse 6, 
This is what it says. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is Philippians 4 verse 6. Have you ever wondered why some of our prayer requests are not answered? The scripture explains why. James 4 verse 3 says, When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. John 15 verse 7 also says, If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given. Matthew 21 verse 22 says, If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Lastly, for whom should we pray? 1 Timothy 2 verse 1, Paul says, I urge then, first of all, that prayer, requests, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. James says this in James 5 verse 16, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And lastly, Paul says in Ephesians 6 verse 18, And pray in the Spirit in all occasions with all kinds of prayer and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. So dear listener, as we wrap up the topic for today, I ask you to spend a few minutes praying for all that the Lord brings to your mind. May the Lord bless you as you pursue the discipline of prayer is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope 
that we have made your day wonderful. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our program today. Feel free to send us your views, comments and suggestions by writing to the producer, Adventist World Radio, PO Box 42276, code 00100, Nairobi, Kenya. We are also online at awrnairobi at eau.adventist.org. I have been your host, Victor Nyacharo, and I leave you with this item of music termed, Paired in the Wood. <laughs> 